Let me begin introducing the next speaker, Zafra Lerman. Uh, she's not a physicist. Her doctorate is in chemistry from the Weizmann Institute of Science in Israel. And she's conducted research on isotope effects at Cornell and Northwestern here in the States and at ETH Zurich, Switzerland. She has also developed an innovative approach of teaching science using art, music, and dance, which proved to be successful with disadvantaged students all around the world. Also very importantly for the context of our today's session, she has worked on human rights and uh, helped resolve issues with scientists in Russia, China, Cuba, Peru, Iran. Uh, she serves as president of the Malta Conferences Foundation, which brings together scientists from multiple countries, um, mostly from the Middle East, right? Uh, together with Nobel laureates for, um, it's five days, right? To establish cross-border collaborations, and she has received over 40 international awards, including presidential award from the President of the United States. Um, she is also the winner of the Sakharov Prize from the Committee uh, for International Freedom of Scientists of the American Physical Society. And uh, she actually is a nominee for the Nobel Peace Prize several times. So, Dr. Lerman, you have the floor. Thank you very much for inviting me to be a speaker at the American Physical Society. I'm a chemist and I chaired the Committee on Scientific Freedom and Human Rights for the American Chemical Society from its inception till the American Chemical Society thought in 20, 11, that there is no need anymore to a committee like that. Uh, during this period, I managed to work on, with my committee on a lot of cases, it, starting with the Soviet Union, the Refuseniks, and then moving to other countries that you can see the pictures here, like Cuba, China, and I would like now to tell you about my experience. I planned my talk to call for action both for human rights and peace from the audience. I remember when we were organizing in the 80s a symposia like that in the American Chemical Society, the room will, would have been packed and I think that it tells us that we have to do more work to explain to people why now this work is more important than ever, exactly as the title of this uh, symposium here, because everybody should take part with what is going on now in Ukraine. Uh, my mother was born in Kiev, my father was born in Odessa, I was in Kiev several times in the 80s, uh, working on human rights, and it just breaks my heart to see what's going on. So with that, I will, oh, it's not moving? Okay. I had the privilege to meet with Andrei Sakharov in 1988 when he received the Albert Einstein Peace Prize Foundation, and I was on the executive committee of this organization. Uh, I had uh, the chance to talk to him with a translator, and he suggested that before I go back to the Soviet Union, I should take a crash course in Russian, and this way I will not need a translator that probably would have been a KGB member. I, the other thing that he said 
is never let off the pressure on government when you deal with human rights. I took his advice to heart and took a crash course in Russia, went to the Soviet Union. Uh, I usually went with a group of chemists as a cover-up. In the morning, we were lecturing in different universities. And after midnight, I would have gone by myself. I went by myself. And in dark alleys, I met refuseniks that then we went, all of us together, for a seminar at 2 o'clock in the morning in some dark attic. With that, I could bring a scientific material to them, what was illegal by that time, and I could take back their CV and work on their behalf. We managed to bring to freedom uh, many of these scientists, and the sucker of advice to me was extremely beneficial because I would go by myself and all what I did, I would look at my group and think who is reliable and would not be frightened with my activities. And I would tell this person, if I'm not here tomorrow for breakfast, please call the American Embassy and don't ask more questions. It's not moving. Uh, I like to uh, quote here, or oh, you can read it by yourself. Yuri Tarnopolsky was one of the refuseniks that was arrested and sent to labor camp in 1984, uh, what he wrote there is what is in common for the uh, prisoners that is there because of his conscience and the person that tried to help him. This he wrote, by the way, to the American Physical Society when I was nominated for the Albert for the Henry Sakharov uh, Prize. I hope you had a chance to read it. We thought that with the fall of the Soviet Union, our work will be finished, but there was no change. The only change that happened that the letter case GB will change to FSB. And Alexander Nikitin was a nuclear engineer that work with the Norwegian Bologna Foundation and show them where the Soviets uh, dumped radioactive material from submarines in the North Sea. And suddenly he was arrested. Uh, retroactive laws were written to make him a spy and he had a trial. He was arrested first, then he was released to house arrest. I managed to meet with him in St. Petersburg during that time, and with all the effort, we managed to bring him in 2000 to the US. He gave a talk to the American Chemical Society at 9.30 p.m., because this was the only time we had a, a, a room for that, it was attended by more than a thousand people. All the Canadian and American media was there, and it was carried live on C-SPAN. This is how the scientists was ve were very involved during this period in issues of human rights. In uh, 1989, we had to concentrate on China uh, because, as all of you know, about the Tiananmen Square disaster. And we were working very hard on China. The pro-democracy uh, physicist, uh, Feng Liji, uh, had to escape to the US 
embassy because otherwise he would have been arrested and tortured. He was hiding there for a whole year, and when he was released, uh, he came immediately to visit me, and for my, he gave a lot of lectures, was interviewed by many, many newspapers, but the most important thing, he gave a talk directly to China in Chinese through Voice of America for my office. Uh, Professor Xu was a very distinguished physicist uh, who worked really uh, on translating Albert Einstein to Chinese. He was number two uh, most uh, sought for, but because of his age, and Chinese have respect somehow to age, he was in house arrest and not in a prison, but he was talking uh, and sending uh, statements concerning the students that were in a prison. The leader of the students was Liu Gang, that the physicist, is a physicist, and we all worked very hard on his behalf. He was in jail six years and was tortured badly till he managed to come to the US. Uh, I was invited to deliver a lecture in China in a conference uh, titled Public Understanding of Science, and I dedicated my lecture to the scientists and students that I told the Chinese helped to develop the country, but we're now in prison, and I told them that I hoped they would have come to my lecture, but sadly, they could not come. As a result of that, I was interviewed after that in the, uh, on the national Chinese television, and the American group I went with was very afraid that all of us will be arrested, but we came out uh, safely. The same, I had letters with me from Feng Liji to different dissidents. One of them is Professor Xu. I managed to meet him with him in his apartment, but my translator after that was called for a questioning, why did we go to Professor Xu that was in house arrest, so uh, working on human rights sometimes uh, is in risk to your own safety, but it's necessary. And now with the war in Ukraine, it's necessary that every one of us will take action. I, I'm sad that a young Sakharov did not appear on the arena because I'm sure be, that Sakharov would have uh, find a way to directly uh, communicate to Putin to stop this murder and nightmare. Oop. Uh, this is a physics student. The, uh, the APS gave him the Andrei Sakharov. He was arrested uh, as a spy. He was a PhD student here. And we all had to work very hard uh, on his behalf. It's in Iran. Uh, I was asked to say uh, something about the cases now. I'm the vice chair of the board of the Committee of Concerned Scientists that started during Sakharov, and I just took a picture of one page of all the cases we have to deal with. So human rights is a big, big problem around the world, and we need everybody to help us with that. These are the universities, one in uh, Moskva, the other one in Leningrad, St. Petersburg, that hosted my group during the day, 
and at night I could go and deal with the refused nicks. Uh, Cuba was another issue, and Cuba was really scientific freedom and human rights. The scientific freedom was for us, because we were not allowed to go to Cuba. <clears throat> we needed to get a license. <clears throat> it was very hard to get a license. My senator, Dick Derbin, helped us, and in 98, we took we got the license and took the first group to a Cuba where we could work at night on human rights there too. Uh, this is Philip, Fidel Castro Jr. that is a nuclear physicist and he was the science advisor to his father. Uh, I became very friendly with him and he was very helpful to me during that uh, period, then <clears throat> I was elected as an honorary member of the Cuban Chemical Society. Uh, this is the American that was the ambassador, but you could not use the word ambassador. He hosted, I took seven delegation to Cuba. He hosted my uh, delegation in his house and I put what the eagle there said because it's a very, very important statement for all of us these days. I was asked to tell you about the effort in, for peace in the Middle East using science and science diplomacy. Uh, we are bringing together scientists from all the 15 Middle East countries and now on their request, Morocco and Pakistan uh, joined together. Uh, these scientists spent five days together with six Nobel laureates, developing friendship and collaboration <coughs> to solve issues of the region and of the world like water, energy, food security, science education, uh, we started it after 9-11, after the attack on the Twin Towers in New York, and we suggested to the American Chemical Society that we should put our attention now into the Middle East. And the first conference was held in 2003 on the island of Malta, because I felt that an island would be safer. It was in the heights of the Antifada, the uprising in uh, the West Bank, where a lot of people were killed, both in Israel and the West Bank, and we needed security for this conference. Uh, uh, science diplomacy can uh, overcome cultural, religious, and political barrier where other forms of diplomacy have failed. I like this picture because it shows you the difference between the people that come to the, uh, to the conference. Uh, those are the ma main reason for this conference, to provide a platform for people to see what unites them, <coughs> and then what separates them to uh, have a forum where people can uh, uh, form collaborations to solve the issues of the region, to uh, reduce the animosity and the uh, tendency to demonize the unknown other, and to catalyze the collaborations that are being formed between the scientists that may, uh, many of their uh, governments are hostile to each other. Uh, these are two Nobel laureates that are sitting there, Roald Hoffman and Martin Karplus, and those are, regu are our regulation. The most important one is no accompanying member to the chemist, we could explain it, that if you dilute the solution, the reaction slows down, and we wanted maximum collaboration, 
so no accompanying member could go to this conference. Here you have the list of all the conferences and the places that uh, we ran our conferences. Uh, the reason that we had to jump around is the visa. When we started in Malta, the two first one, Malta was not part of the EU and the Schengen visa. But once they became part, visa became a terrible, terrible issue. No visa for Iran, no visa for uh, uh, Syria. So the problem of the visa was a huge obstacle to overcome. And therefore, we had to jump around. Uh, the Malta conferences are the only platform in the world where these scientists can get together exchange ideas, feel protected, because as I mentioned, we have there Iran, Iraq, Syria, Israel, Palestine, and all the rest of them. So you can see here interactive workshop, how the people work, all of them together, and you cannot really distinguish from which country they are coming. The Nobel laureates uh, play a very important role in this conference, and they are really a big attraction for many of the participants to be ready to go to this conference and meet with each other. Uh, you can see here we have 16 of them, many participated in several uh, workshops, and I think in the next one, we will add a few new ones. It's always important to have dignitaries here, there too for giving the conference a special status. So usually the president of the Republic of Malta attends the conference and opens the conference when we are in Malta and spend time with the participants. Uh, when we were in Jordan, His Royal Highness Prince Hassan, King Hussein's brother, opened the conference, but since then he participated already in several conferences. Uh, Irina Bokova was the Director General of UNESCO, and in 2011 she invited the conference to UNESCO because it was the International Year of Chemistry, and this was one of the last events for this time. Prince Hassan attended this conference too. We have many ambassadors that are attending, so we have dignitaries uh, coming and interacting with our participants. Uh, now we, as all of you know about the SDGs, we try to work on several SDGs. This is the one in education. You can see Nobel laureate Roald Hoffman with people from Egypt, Lebanon, Jordan, Qatar, Iran, all working together with Roald Hoffman. Uh, the other SDG, is equality for women. And you can see here, we attract what is not an easy task in the Middle East, many women, and we opened, uh, we started a women's forum. Uh, water is for sure a big issue in the Middle East. The picture with the dark water is water in Gaza. Gaza doesn't have any clean drinking water. And therefore, this is an extremely important workshop. We have collaboration between Israel, Palestine, Jordan, because they share the same aqueduct. And uh, the water is a very, very successful uh, project. Uh, energy is another SDG, and this is one of our projects. It's in the desert in Israel. It's between Israel, Palestine, and Jordan. Uh, we always have in Malta 
a workshop on chemistry, bio biology, and nuclear security, and trying to encourage everybody to work really on getting rid of uh, this material. We have, there are only three countries that did not sign the chemical convention, and two of them are in our conference, and we are working on them to persuade the government uh, to join OPCW as the organization of the prohibition of chemical weapon. Uh, this is uh, the first collaboration that happened between Israel and the UAE, and it's on COVID, was unveiled in, on a Zoom, in uh, Malta on a Zoom because of the pandemic. And it was covered by 568 newspapers around the world. In the US, it was in the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal. Another Zoom, we had the president of the US National Academy of Medicine, and you can see, oh, sorry, and you can see he showed us how it affects the SDG. We produced masks with our logo and sent it to all our participants. You see Israel, Oman, Jordan, Iran, Egypt, Palestine, Iraq, United States. And those are the challenges that we face. I said the visa is a very big challenge. Uh, we have to pay for everybody so they don't have to ask money from their universities or government. So we have to raise all the money needed for the conference and to get the collaboration across borders is not an easy task. Those are four speeches that were made on the floor of the US Congress, two in the Senate and two in the House Representative about Malta. Those are different awards. Uh, the one there from the UN, they have still the video, uh, is an award for peace and justice that is SDG number 16. And this is why we received it in the General Assembly in front of the green wall that you see the leaders always delivering their speeches. And Thank you very much. 40 seconds left, so. <laughs> and the floor is now open for questions. I have a question. So that eagle in Havana, what exactly does the inscription say? Oh, the eagle, uh, it's, uh, it talks about the uh, eagle that was uh, taken, you know, I did not memorize it, but from the main, the boat that was completely destroyed and the eagle survived and they wrote that this is a sign for the survival of the relationship between the US and Cuba. Other questions, please. I have a question. Mm. Okay, so you have to use this mic. I have a question. Um, so, uh, Dr. Lerman, you have done a tremendous amount of work the past 50 years. Thank you, uh, People can yes, you've done a tremendous amount of work these past 50 years, um, and we, we are all very grateful for that. Uh, you obviously have a lot of influence um, in, in the world. You, you managed to get all these Nobel laureates to come to the Malta conference, um, and now we are faced with this terrible situation in the Ukraine. Uh, do you think you, you can bring any influence uh, on that situation with your contacts 
I was already approached by few, for, by few think tanks uh, if we can organize a conference between scientists in Russia and the Ukraine, and we are looking into that. And we are looking. Uh, what the purpose of my talk was to get people involved in human rights and peace and to show where, what each of us can do. There are a lot of people that work now free because of the work of different human rights committees. So I hope uh, it's too bad we have such a small audience, but even this audience, I hope you all of you will get involved, and especially now time is of essence in uh, Ukraine. So my question is, so I teach at a small college in Kentucky. It's a liberal arts college. And the students are often interested in things like human rights. And, and one of the, the things, when we teach physics in particular, we think, well, I really can't bring in these outside sorts of things like human rights issues, environmental issues, because we're so focused on the physical science itself. And, I'm, and my question has to do with thinking about strategies of ways of introducing topics within the context of teaching the science that I need to teach in the course. Now, I could certainly design a course that's independent of that, that's collaborative, and they would love that at the, at the college. But I also want to figure out ways, strategies to bring these sorts of issues into my day-to-day -day teaching, and, and so that every student I teach is introduced to the ideas of uh, the human rights struggle that's been going on for, you know, basically forever. And I don't know if you have specific suggestions for doing it. Uh, let me tell you, you teach in a liberal arts college in Kentucky. Yes. Uh, I think in Kentucky you better be careful what you bring into <laughs> the class. But I taught in uh, Chicago and I could bring it in the class and my students we are all of them extremely involved with everything I did in writing letters in, uh, because my students were all in the arts. Because, uh, this is why I taught science the arts. They were extremely helpful in designing things what we needed and in demonstrating. But I think in Kentucky it might be a little bit different, but you can bring these things in by talking about the work that this dissident uh, did, uh, like Andrei Sakharov, and then you can bring it as part of the work. Feng Liji was a very famous uh, astronomer, he was a physicist. You can uh, mention his work and then mention how he started all the pro-democracy movement and was the number one person uh, wanted after Tiananmen Square. And uh, so it's not that you try to separate and say human rights, but you have to be very careful because I read all the time in uh, Texas and in states like that, that if God forbid a teacher says something, <laughs> but you can bring it by talking on certain physicists about their life. Yeah, and what, like Albert Einstein, Pagwash started as a result of a manifesto written by Albert Einstein and Bertrand Russell that was a philosopher in England. And they wrote in the 50s a manifesto calling upon the scientists from both sides, the Soviet Union and the US, to get together in a conference and discuss how to guarantee that we will not face a nuclear war. And so all the Pagwash is a result of the work of Albert Einstein. Uh, my God, you for sure mentioned Albert Einstein yeah. in your class. So you can talk about all his involvement in that, especially after uh, the bomb in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. So you can bring it in. I could, uh, uh, my president wanted me to discuss this issue. That, that's not a problem. No, they would support me, so <laughs> yeah, that's good. But you can bring it just because of the state you are in uh, through describing scientists. 
Yeah. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you.